Okay, great. Well, thank you for coming. This is the Ethics and Research and Biotechnology Consortium series. As you know, this is a series that brings bioethics and research ethics to some of the latest research in biotechnology and bioengineering. Um, let me just go over some ground rules for those of you who may be joining us for the first time. We welcome questions from the audience during the uh, talk. And to do that, please enter your questions into the Q&A box found at the bottom of your screen. Don't use the chat box unless you need some uh, technical assistance and the chat will go directly to the panelists and to the administrators. Um, at the end of the presentation, we will have time for a Q&A with the audience and I will be moderating that. Um, look for you know, uh, upcoming events for next year at the website bioethics.hms.harvard.edu. And uh, let me go ahead and get started introducing our speaker for today. So uh, Dr. Julie Kim is the CZ Y. Hung Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology at Northwestern University's Feinberg School of Medicine. She is also Northwestern's co-director uh, of, of the Center for Reproductive Science, and she received her PhD in Cellular and Molecular Biology at University Laval in Quebec. Her research focuses on understanding the development and growth of diseases that affect the uterus. She's helped develop physiological models of the female reproductive tract, which can be used to interrogate research questions surrounding fertility and disease and for testing new drugs. Uh, so she's here today to talk with us about the development and use of some of these modeling systems. The title of today's session is Evitar and Other Bioengineered Models of the Female Reproductive System. Uh, Dr. Kim, the floor is yours. Welcome. Thank you. I will just share my slides now. Okay, I hope everybody can see that. Yep, well, thank you. Great. Um, I really appreciate this invitation to talk to you about um, our research, and I think this is a great platform for all of us to share ideas not just from the biological perspective, but really from um, the ethical perspective as well as reproduction is highly, um, a, a subject that is highly um, dis discussable or conversable um, in the ethics field. Um, this is, the slides are changing um, just by themselves. So, um, all right. I have nothing to disclose before we start. And so because this is a more broad audience, I wanted to give you a good background on uh, the female reproductive tract. I know you've heard a lot about some of the other fields of biology, um, but here we have the female reproductive tract um, that is, uh, consists of multiple different units um, that, um, um, that makes up the whole tract. And so for example, we have the ovary where we have follicles and um, oocytes that develop and are eventually ovulated. And once ovulation occurs, we have an organ called the corpus luteum that then secretes different kinds of hormones. Um, once the egg is released, it goes through the fallopian tube. I'm sorry. It goes through the fallopian tube where um, if there is an egg, egg and, and sperm present, that's where um, the egg is fertilized in the fallopian tube. Um, and then we have the endometrium or the body of the uterus and the lining of the uterus is the endometrium where eventually the embryo will attach, implant and start to grow. Uh, we have also the cervix, um, which um, is, is the actual bottom part of the reproductive tract as well as the vagina. And so those are the um, units of the female reproductive tract that we should keep in mind. And, and really the, the goal or the function of the uh, female reproductive tract is to be able to carry uh, a fetus uh, to term so that we can eventually um, have live birth uh, at the end of uh, approximately nine and a half months. Um, and that is why it is such an important organ to have because it is essential for the propagation of our species. And so um, this is a, a, a little bit more detailed look of, of what the female reproductive tract does. As you can see here in the ovary, there are follicles which are made up of the egg, the oocyte, um, surrounded by uh, support cells, usually granulosa and theca cells. 
And this is the unit that um, releases hormones such as estrogen and progesterone. Um, and so once the hormones are released and the egg is released, um, it, the hormones are shared throughout the reproductive tract to um, make changes of the reproductive tract tissues, the fallopian tube, the endometrium, the cervix, et cetera. And estrogen, which is the predominant hormone during the follicular phase, that's before ovulation occurs, it provides proliferation or growth um, uh, capabilities of uh, some of these tissues, and especially for the endometrium. Once there is ovulation, then the corpus luteum, as I mentioned, forms, progesterone is released. And progesterone then does even more things um, that prepares that uterine lining for implantation occur. There is a very specific window of time where an embryo can implant. And that means that the endometrium has to be receptive. It has to be perfect for that embryo to attach and implant and, and establish pregnancy. And so this is a very um, um, orchestrated uh, and very controlled um, process that occurs every 28 days. Now, if there is no um, pregnancy, there is no embryo present, present, then of course that lining that's prepared is shed when the hormones levels drop. And so this is a, a more graphical presentation of what happens is when you see the follicles on top there, um, growing uh, and then ovulating in the corpus luteum forming, those are the, so that is the source of estrogen and progesterone. And in order for those follicles to grow, we need signals from the brain. These are hormones that are released by the pituitary gland, luteinizing hormone, as well as follicle stimulating hormone. This is what controls the growth of the follicles. And that, like I said, there's estrogen and progesterone, um, being released, but what we can appreciate here is the fluctuation in the levels that change over the course of time. We have a peak of estradiol that's formed during the luteal, uh, the follicular phase, and then the rise of progesterone that occurs in the luteal phase, and that those fluctuations of hormones are what changes that endometrial lining. And this fluctuation, this partnership that occurs between the estrogen and progesterone are key for that uh, regulated and very controlled growth of that endometrium. Um, and so we see that um, it's a complicated process. There's a lot of things going on within the one menstrual cycle um, when there is no pregnancy, like I said. Uh, the, the lining sheds, you get menses, and then the cycle starts all over again. And so we know this because of the research that has been done in, in humans as well as mouse models, but there are obvious limitations in the kinds of research that we can do with female reproductive tract, mostly because um, women are born or girls are born um, with a, a reserve of uh, follicles. That means there's only a set number of uh, follicles that can ovulate. Um, we can't make more yet. Um, and, and, and once that reserve is um, used up, then there is no more. And that's hence, that's what happens during menopause. And so because there is limited reserve, um, there is a very little that we should be doing in order to insult or put these um, follicle pools at risk. Um, research is also limited because there's vast species differences in the reproductive um, tract. Uh, we've learned a lot using mouse models and primate models, um, but there are limitations because not all of the processes are identical. For example, uh, the placentation of humans is very distinct from the rest of the species. Um, what happens in, in, in humans is that the trophoblast or the, 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 the embryonic tissues, they um, infiltrate or they, they invade very deeply and they just tap into the maternal vessels so that the, the, they're sharing of blood very early on. A lot of the species don't have that. Most of them are superficial implantation. And so, you know, knowing those species differences also, um, we can use that information to our advantage as well. And I'll be showing you later on um, how we can um, use differences, but then understanding the biology 
of what um, drives the human reproductive processes, we can then um, use those um, signals to make other species behave in, in a way that the human tissues behave. And I'll go into that more in a bit detail later. Um, and studying hormones, especially female hormones, estrogen and progesterone, it's quite complicated because we're talking about fluctuations as well as partnerships between estrogen and progesterone. Um, that's really hard to mimic um, in vitro. Um, also, hormones do act um, all over the body. They don't act just on the, on the reproductive tract, but they do affect almost every tissue in the body. And their actions are very context dependent, depending on the cell type, the tissue, how much there is, how long it's been exposed. And so every context is different. Um, and with that said, um, because of this, let's see, yes. Um, a lot of the preclinical and clinical research has been done primarily in males. Um, I mean, it's difficult enough to have a clinical trial going uh, and, and to getting um, data at the end, um, but adding, people thought that adding in women to the trials would introduce a lot of complications, a lot of variability because of the hormone variability that I just mentioned. Um, but then the result of that, of having a lot of these trials focused on males, the re result of that is that we don't really know what the side effects for women are going to be until the drug is already on the market. And that is what has been observed for many drugs that have come out. Um, eight out of 10 drugs have been pulled from the market because they had um, serious side effects in more in women than in men. And, and some of those are listed on the right there, um, those drugs that have been pulled. Now, for example, if we take statins, and many, many people take statins for cholesterol, um, we do see a lot of differences in terms of the side effects uh, for uh, males versus on the right versus females on the left. And so these sex differences, we cannot ignore them. They do exist. But how do you study that? How do you test drugs without putting that reproductive tract in risk or the fertility function uh, or compromising the fertility function of women. And so this is the big um, gap in knowledge that we have right now. And because um, research is limited um, and then a lot of drugs, drugs cannot be tested directly in women that can infect the reproductive tract, um, we don't know a lot. And, and, you know, it's amazing to know that a lot of the diseases that affect the female reproductive tract, as listed here, there is not a great therapy for any of them other than surgery. Um, so infertility, you know, it can stem from um, bad oocytes or follicles, um, you know, you know, you can get ectopic pregnancies because the fallopian tube is not able to brush the, uh, the embryo into the uterus. And there are a lot of endometrial disorders as well, um, including endometriosis, um, endometrial cancer. Um, even the muscle layer of the uh, uterus um, can um, form tumors uh, such as fibroids. And then there is cancer of the cervix, cancer of the ovary that can occur. Um, there's premature ovarian failure, um, young women uh, not um, having those, those eggs that are reserved, um, uh, usable. And then there's um, a polycystic ovarian syndrome, which I will describe a little later, that affects not just the ovaries, but a lot of other organs in the body. And so I guess the take home message for this is that there are still pathologies that affect the female reproductive tract. They're called women's diseases, um, but really there's really no good therapies right now to eradicate or to cure any of these. And this is because it's really hard to study um, this outside of a woman's body. And so that was our research goal, is to develop a physiomimetic or something that we can test in the lab outside of a woman's body the female reproductive tract to ultimately use as a tool to better screen compounds that come into market or drugs. Um, 
but also to better understand the biology of the reproductive tract and then ultimately understand why diseases happen and what we can do um, to combat those diseases. And before I move on, I just want to acknowledge the team that was involved um, in the initial um, building of this reproductive tract in vitro. Um, it takes a village, honestly. Um, and this was really driven by Teresa Woodruff, who was the PI of this program um, about 10 years ago. Um, and then we had collaborators, uh, Joanna Burdett, who focused on the fallopian tube. Um, myself, I was uh, in charge of building the uterus, Spiro and Thomas Hope, the cervix. And then we worked with engineers, Jonathan Capetta and Jeff Bornstein from Draper Labs. And so again, I just wanna acknowledge this whole team and I'm just speaking on behalf of everyone um, on this project. And so about 10 years ago, the Tissue Chip Consortium was um, introduced or was developed. And this was basically NIH and DARPA getting together and offering um, uh, funds to create um, physiomimetics. And so organs on a chip, microphysiological systems, where um, um, organs can be represented outside of the body and placed in culture systems where it can mimic potential blood flow and more physiological environments so that we can eventually um, test drugs and compounds in a meaningful way. So this would be a huge, a significant advance to what is already available. And so we were able to um, obtain some of that, be involved in the tissue chip consortium and build EVITAR, which somebody very cleverly coined the mother of microphysiological systems. And basically this would consist of a, a system, a microfluidic plate where we can house um, different compartments or units of the female reproductive tract, um, including the ovary, uterus, cervix, fallopian tube. And then we put in a liver in there um, in order to understand what would happen if a liver was present that, um, with the female reproductive tract in hopes that we can add in compounds where the liver can metabolize uh, these compounds. And so like I said, um, the collaboration was built between Draper Labs um, and our PIs at Northwestern and UIC. These are the various people that were in charge of building a specific, their specific organ of interest um, in vitro. And then um, Draper Labs, they, they built this microfluidic system um, it, so that um, these, these specific units could communicate with each other and that that would be a continuous flow of media um, kind of uh, mimicking the blood. And so this was the platform they built and designed for us. Um, it's basically a plug and play kind of um, unit where each of these um, compartments you can take, add in or take out. Um, and once they're added in, they are all connected through microfluidic channels. And so they would share media uh, in any specific direction you tell it to. Um, but the first, uh, the, the, the criteria for building such a, uh, a, a, a system would be that it could be sterilized because we all know in vitro cultures require a sterile environment. It cannot be toxic to the cells or follicles. Um, depending on the materials they are made of, sometimes they do leach toxins and that would be detrimental to any of the cell types that we um, use. And, um, and this is something that's unique to our system is that they cannot bind hormones. So a lot of the fluidics platforms out there are made of substances such as PDMS, which absorb hormones, absorb hydrophilic compounds um, so that the, the actual cells don't see them um, as in, in the same concentrations you think they're supposed to see. So that would not be conducive to our system. And of course, these pumping systems would be computer controlled and it would be customized to whatever we think the flow rate should be. And so this was built. And we also needed, um, because we're talking about the human menstrual cycle, and I gave you some background on that, we also needed a source of hormones that would not only uh, provide them in a certain level, but they would be fluctuating over a period of 28 days. 
Um, and so this was a challenge. Um, and we, um, we thought the only thing that can really do this is an ovary. And so this is where Teresa um, did her magic in that um, we used mouse ovaries instead of the human ovaries um, to, um, to provide that source of um, ovarian hormones, um, including estrogen and progesterone. So this was kind of tricky uh, because the mouse ovary or the mouse, their estrous cycle is only four days long, whereas the human menstrual cycle is 28 days. But as I was mentioning before, knowing what um, drives hormone production um, and in what context, she was able to treat these mouse ovaries with LH and FSH, which are the, uh, the pituitary gland hormones that then act on the ovaries to um, grow the follicles and mature them. So she was able to add in FSH and LH in the program of like a human menstrual cycle. And so it, um, she would add an FSH over a period of 14 days. And assuming that the mouse ovaries would respond to that, then she would cause them to ovulate by adding a high bolus of LH or the, what we use in the lab as HCG, which is an LH mimic. Um, and then um, continue that on so that progesterone can be um, uh, produced. And the reason why mouse ovaries are used here is that um, there is a, not many human ovaries that we can use um, from the clinic, nor should we, because we are looking for ovaries from a fertile woman, so premenopausal, um, and and, and these tissues are very hard to come by. Plus, as I mentioned, um, women have a, a dictated reserve of, of follicles that you don't want to mess up with or, or put anything at risk of, of fertility. And so um, that is, a, is an area where um, I guess um, the ethics committee can be really uh, discuss and converse about this, that you know, the whole, is, is the human ovary um, necessary? For us to do um, human studies in the reproductive tract. And so um, that is the reason why um, mouse ovaries are used. Julie, I have a, a quick question for you. Sure. Um, is there any interest by your group or other groups in the future to maybe use uh, human ovarian tissue from uh, younger persons pre, uh, pre cancer treatment uh, to hopefully you know, provide a means for them to have uh, mature oocytes later? Oh, absolutely. Right. Um, and so that's where the, um, so Teresa would have also formed this consortium called Onco Fertility, where they do just that. Um, they are interested in, in preserving some of that ovarian tissue um, so that um, uh, younger women or even girls can undergo chemotherapies or what have you, uh, drug treatments that usually harm the ovary. Um, but um, once they um, um, take that reserve and, and preserve it, then they can retransplant those um, later on after all of the therapies are done so that they are able to eventually um, conceive. Um, uh, Wonderful. And, I'm sure we'll, we'll return to these issues during the Q&A. If any of you have questions for Dr. Kim, please enter that into the Q&A function. Um, thank you. Yeah. So even though I said we don't have the ovarian tissues in the clinic to study, um, there are cases where there is healthy normal ovary that is um, removed in the context of, for example, prolapse, where um, the whole uterus um, is, is coming out because the muscles aren't there to support it. And so there are cases like that. And we have researchers at Northwestern that are doing aging studies using whole human ovaries um, obtained this way. And so here is an example of what Teresa Woodruff's lab did um, using mouse ovaries. Um, what, as you can see um, in, the, in the pictures, this is what a mouse ovary looks like. Remember, um, a mouse has multiple follicles in their ovary um, that can ovulate at the same time, whereas a human 
has usually one dominant follicle that eventually operate, operates every cycle. But the mouse has multiple, as you can see, uh, those, those um, circles um, in these pictures are follicles that are growing. Um, and um, she adds an FSH um, over a period of time, the follicles grow to the point where they're growing to a certain size. She adds a bolus of LH and then the um, ovary is able to ovulate or that, that follicle is able to ovulate. And then because of these events, we have that increase in estrogen that occurs when the follicles are growing and then the progesterone um, being released after ovulation when the corpus luteum has formed. And interestingly, using these mouse ovaries, she thought, well, what would happen if we continue to add LH, which is, we use HCG, like I said, it's, it's like a chemical mimic of LH. Um, and HCG, as, as we all know, is the pregnancy hormone, right? And that's one that signals to the ovary, hey, there is an embryo here. Um, we need that ovarian support of progesterone. And that's exactly what happened when she added HCG over a prolonged period of time over the cycle. We got that um, high level of progesterone being maintained over the course of, of the cycle. So that was pretty cool. And that was really proof of concept that these mouse ovaries are indeed responding to these gonadotropes. And that was what is, was fueling or that was driving um, EVATAR, um, those, those mouse ovarian hormones is, is what um, drove um, that hormone production. Um, and then that um, the, the the rest of the downstream tissues, including the uterus, the cervix, the fallopian tube, was then able to respond um, to those ovarian hormones because this EVATAR allowed communication of uh, the media between the different units. And that's what we asked the engineers to do is to provide channels to connect each of the compartments together, um, but also allow some recirculation to happen within each of the compartments so that there's a bit of mixing of um, the media. And so that's, that's, this is a schema of what was designed for the platform. We went from follicle to fallopian tube, to the uterus, to ectocervix, and then we had a liver. Um, and then we had um, an acceptor well, which is basically media that's collected um, at the end of the one circuit. Um, we had a donor well where it was fresh media where we added in the gonadotropes FSH and LH exogenously. Now, it'd be great to add in um, the pituitary <laughs> to be able to um, naturally release those, uh, the LH and the FSH. It's an incredibly uh, complicated process. Um, we're not there yet, so we're adding in the LH and FSH um, on our own. So I just want to summarize what happened. What happened to the downstream tissues when we had all of these hormones there? Um, the fallopian tube, uh, we saw that um, it did um, uh, provide that physiologic um, environment so that the cilia would be beating, that epithelial, would, epithelial cells would proliferate. Um, the endometrium also um, functioned and responded to the hormones in a physiologic way. There is a, a, a process called decidualization that are, happens uh, with estrogen and progesterone, and that is what happened uh, in the endometrium. The ectocervix, that squamous layer grew, um, uh, mucins were secreted, etc. cetera. Um, so what we learned from this study was that um, all of these tissues when we study um, individually in each of our labs, they take a certain amount, there's a certain type of media, but when they were all together, um, they all thrived in one media, which was amazing, um, which was um, suggesting that each of these tissues were able to secrete the factors that were necessarily to prolong um, longevity of the tissues. And that's what we saw over the 28 days as well, that uh, these cells were healthy, these tissue units were healthy, um, there was minimal damage at, at the end of 28 days, um, which is a very long time for something to be cultured in vitro. Julie, I have a yeah. quick question for you. Yeah. So when this avatar system was first um, published and released uh, you know, in, in, to the public, did you have any challenges in communicating what you did here to both the media and to the public? I have to confess, I have a confession to make to you, Julie. When this first broke, I did an interview with NPR, 
and they had asked me uh, a lot of questions. One of the questions they asked me was, is there anything to be concerned about for these kinds of uh, ex vivo, you know, um, outside the body modeling systems of human reproduction? And I said, the only thing that I could think of that might be of concern in the very distant future is ex vivo um, embryogenesis or, or like ex vivo gestation. And I said, but we're not talking about that here. Now, when my comment was published in the article, uh, they left out that last little part about that's not what we're talking about here. So I even found it challenging as a bioethicist to talk about this to a, to a well-respected media organization like NPR. What were your experiences like talking to media? Um, yeah, and, and, and I would love to talk about this. So here, great segue. Um, we got a ton of media attention because basically this was the first reproductive tract ex vivo um, that was created. And so um, what I found was that um, people, the reporters did contact us directly and, and did very nice interviews um, and they were accurately, accurately represented in the articles. But then you do see a lot of these other news um, channels where they would just look at, um, not interview us, but look at these other articles and then write their own things. And basically, um, I mean, this is a pretty complicated process really um, to understand, um, but a, a lot of these, um, the higher news um, agencies were, were pretty accurate in, 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 de in describing uh, our system. So they called it the menstrual cycle on a chip, you know, um, and, it was it was it was pretty it was pretty cool for everybody to um, to read about this. But then you see these articles that um, label it as period in the petri dish, or scientists have recreated a period, and that's the furthest thing that we did. There was absolutely no bleeding or menstruation or blood vessels in this unit, um, and so I I found that you know I think that um, the potential inaccuracies that we sometimes see in the news media was really evident um, in, in, this, um, in this study. I mean, you can't, like I said, it, it's, a, it's a pretty complicated concept. Um, when you're talking about the menstrual cycle, I don't think people know exactly what is involved in, in, in all of the different intricate steps. You talk, when you talk about menstrual cycle, you, talk, you think about periods, right? We talk about bleeding. Um, and I think there was there was also one article and I couldn't find it. I was I was looking for it online um, because it was a very funny title. It was like a vagina in a dish or something. And it, it just made me laugh. And um, I actually wrote back to the author and said, this is inaccurate. Um, this is not what we did. <laughs> so <laughs> I hope that answered your question. Okay. So in summary of EVATAR, we were able to reprogram mouse ovaries to, to um, secrete estrogen and progesterone in the pattern of a human menstrual cycle, um, which was a huge feat and a great uh, thing to do. And then downstream tissues, what we saw that they did respond to these hormones and they actually really liked sharing media and paraffin factors with each other that increased their longevity. And it, it made them more responsive to these hormones unlike um, what we see when we're um, culturing them individually as separate units. Um, and the, yeah, and so, and so that's, that's what we saw with EVATAR. And so that was EVATAR, that was proof of concept. We, we showed that the female reproductive tract could be represented. I um, mean, there's just so much potential there that we, where we can use this. And so the next phase um, of, of our study was to, model a disease um, using our uh, microfluidics. And so this is the second part to should ship two. Um, and really the goal was to um, understand the disease better because we, are, we have multiple units looking at um, sharing uh, media with each other, um, that we can test drugs um, to see what happens when multiple units are there. Um, and then we can potentially use it um, um, as personalized medicine, depending on what kind of cell types that we use. Um, and then one of the things that we do in the lab that we couldn't do before is to understand if risk factors um, can directly act on tissue and damaged tissue. Um, and so this, is, this opened up a whole new world of research of the female reproductive tract. 
this second part was um, divided into two parts. The first part was, we loved Evitar and all, but it was very, very difficult to use, very expensive. Um, and, you know, it wasn't as versatile as we wanted to because we were biologists and only engineers knew the language of how to run Evitar. And so we wanted to make um, a simpler system that was user friendly to biologists um, that were cheap, that was cheaper uh, to use. And so, but that, that provided the same concept, um, uh, multiple units talking to each other. And so we um, have built that now, we call it Lattice, we call it the daughter of Evitar. Um, it's a second generation version. And I'll tell you all about that. The second part was um, choosing a disease to model. And there is a reproductive disease, um, at least uh, from the ovarian perspective, called uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome. This is a real mysterious syndrome. It impacts a lot of women. And not only um, do these ovaries have multiple cyst-like structures, um, but they don't ovulate as much and they release high testosterone. And so you see um, symptoms of high testosterone in PCOS women. But the other thing is, it's not just an ovarian disease. Um, it impacts uh, the liver, the pancreas, muscle. Um, it, it involves multiple other organ systems because um, a lot of these women also have insulin resistance and obese, they are obese. Um, they have high uh, metabolic syndrome. I mean, there, there's a lot going on. Um, and um, we don't really know what the cause of polycystic ovarian syndrome is, nor we, do we have anything, uh, an effective treatment for this disease. And so we thought, we thought this would be a perfect disease for us to study in a multi-organ fashion. And so I just wanted to go over this uh, picture just to show you what the evolution of lattice looked like. I mean, there were certain criteria that we had to meet. Um, it had to be user friendly, it had to be familiar for biologists, researchers. We all use those 24 wall plates. And so we thought it would be great to mimic a 24 wall plate. We had to make it from a material that did not absorb hormones. Um, and we had to make it from materials that were very cost effective. It had to be reliable, et cetera, et cetera. We did have a version before Lattice um, that we used. We thought maybe we can just 3D print everything because that would be really cheap. Um, we did do that, use materials that were conducive for 3D printing, but then found that these materials do leach um, toxins that are detrimental to the ovary. And so that was scrapped. And so then we partnered up with um, uh, engineers and um, other companies to outsource to build us uh, lattice. And what lattice is, is basically a plate, uh, as, you, as you can see, the black plate with multiple wells that um, have microfluidic channels that uh, connect all of the wells together. Um, it has um, a pumping, so, the, so and then the bottom part is the base station that controls pumping of media across these channels into these compartments. And that's where all the motors are and the sensors are, etc. And so very simple, um, relatively cost efficient, um, and it's, it's pretty easy to use. And so um, I wanted to show you this video. It was um, actually made from a very talented master's student at UIC's micro, uh, my biomedical visual program, um, Sam Palinuk. And so what Gladys does is it's a multi-organ in vitro system to study dynamic interactions of up to eight unique organ cultures that can interact with um, each other for an extended period of time. And here we chose 28 days, which is a menstrual cycle. A liquid media supports nutrient exchange, waste elimination, and enables secreted factors to interact with different tissues via these microscale channels. And then lattice is connected to a computer, which controls the microfluidic uh, actuation of the system, which provides precise media flow through each chamber. And there's a valve mechanism, as you can see here soon, that precisely regulates the volume of the culture media that is transferred from one tissue well to another. So it's a very simple system, as you can see, it just rotates. Um, that media um, into one well to the other well. 
And so just a little bit more about um, polycystic ovarian syndrome. Um, it it's associated with hyperandrogenism, um, ovulatory dysfunction, and polycystic ovary. And again, I said, as I mentioned, it's involved, it's associated with insulin resistance, cardiovascular disease, type two diabetes. It also puts the, the woman at risk for endometrial cancer. There's endometrial hyperplasia going on, um, which is why that's, that's very interesting disease for, for my lab. And so the question is, how do you study uh, on a complex endocrinopathy like PCOS? There are so many factors involved. There's different tissues involved. What is the etiology? I mean, are there environmental uh, factors involved? Um, there are no animal models. Um, you know, how do we do in vitro modeling? And so that was um, uh, the challenge that we were put. And so this is our PCOS in a dish and lattice where we have um, uh, organ systems represented in our lattice, including the ovary and fallopian tube and the endometrium, as well as the liver, the pancreas. And we have space here to put other um, tissues as well. You know, we always have to remind ourselves, um, it's it, conceptually, it makes sense to put X, Y, and Z tissues on this lattice, but you have to build those tissues um, in vitro. And our approach is going 3D. We do everything in 3D. We have organoids, spheroids, explants, tissues, et cetera. Um, and so we, we feel that the, the 3D dimension um, mimics physiology better than 2D for, for, what, for certain things. So the first thing we wanted to do was to make a hyperandrogenic ovary, which is an ovary that makes a lot of androgens, a lot of testosterone. And so how do we do that? Um, if we look back in women and look at their hormone levels, especially the gonadotropes, LH and FSH, we see that women with PCOS have elevated LH across the board, um, across the menstrual cycle. Whereas normal, in the normal menstrual cycle, you see that peak, right? you see that increase and then a decrease of LH. Um, and so we thought, let's do that. Let's add in high, um, high LH and high FSH right at the beginning. And so that's what uh, we did. We put in higher levels of gonadotropes to these mouse ovaries and then to try to trigger ovulation. And what did we find? We found that these mouse ovaries were able to produce high levels of testosterone when we added these high levels of gonadotropes. Um, and that was uh, an amazing thing. And again, um, this shows how pliable, flexible the ovary is, how responsive it is to gonadotropes and how you can manipulate it um, to what it is you want it to, to do. So in this case, high testosterone. And what did this high testosterone do to the downstream tissues? Well, in the fallopian tube, well, one of the characteristic uh, features is that cilia uh, of the tissue, right? It's that cilia that waves the media along, almost like if, if you do have um, implant, uh, an embryo uh, form there, um, then you want it to, it to move along. But if you, um, put in high um, androgens, here you can see PCOS-like, what happens is that the cilia stops beating. Not completely, but the, the rate of beating of cilia decreases significantly. The other thing that we saw for endometrium, remember I said that women with PCOS are at risk for endometrial cancer. Um, they do often have endometrial hyperplasia, which is um, proliferation, overproliferation of those epithelial cells of the endometrium. And in vitro, what we saw in our organoids of the endometrium, that high testosterone did increase proliferation of the epithelial cells of the endometrium. And so we were able to mimic that in vitro. Um, and then we still have um, uh, experiments to do to see what does high testosterone do to um, the pancreatic islets or the liver um, in terms of their function and how those are ongoing. The other question we want to ask is hyperinsulinemia of these women. Is it, is, it, is it the hyperinsulinemia that are driving all of these dysfunctions even on the ovary? And so uh, we have um, pancreatic islets that are able to release insulin 
um, depending on how much glucose that we challenge them with. And so we're going to start this experiment um, with um, these pancreatic islets as being the drivers. And so we can customize this lattice to say who's going to do what first and then who's going to influence um, the other tissues. And, and so this is a very versatile platform that we can ask a lot of these different questions. And so that's, this is just a summary of what we are intending to do. We're gonna take healthy as well as PCOS ovaries, which means high androgen releasing ovaries. We're gonna add in healthy levels of insulin, um, unhealthy levels of ins insulin, et cetera, and see what, what happens to their function. Um, and we can do this in the lattice system in a very controlled fashion um, to see um, what, who is influencing what the most. The other thing um, that I, I, I'm, I'm really interested in is looking at how the PCOS ovary affects the endometrium. Um, we can get end benign endometrium, so not endometrial cancer, but benign endometrium from women that are undergoing hysterectomies, make organoids from them, and then expose them long-term to um, high androgens. And we wanna see, well, what happens to that um, um, endometrium? What are some of the epigenetics um, that are um, epigenic marks that are changing, et cetera. And so this is one study that we have where we're looking at obesity as a risk factor for endometrial cancer. And what we're doing is we're, we're co-culturing um, fat steroids, like in 3D, um, with endometrial organoids over a period of 28 days or longer in the presence of hormones. And so this is basically a premenopausal, obese women um, exposed to menstrual cycle level hormones. What happens to um, that endometrium or the endometrial organoid um, when this happens? And we can look at it at the molecular level, look at potential mutations, gene activation, epigenetic changes, et cetera. And so this is an example of how we can start studying chronic stressors when we are able to um, culture more than one tissue at a time um, for a long period of time. Um, so this is basically, um, what is, this, this is a schema of what we can do with PCOS. We can also, along with the hormones of PCOS, add in environmental disruptors that are linked to PCOS, um, endocrine disrupting chemicals, et cetera. And so we are able to then, like I said, control the environment and control the factors that we're studying on these different tissues at the same time. Um, this is from our collaborator where um, he can screen all these different um, endocrine disrupting compounds using just the ovary or the follicle cultures. Um, these, this is a very sensitive biological unit where, um, you know, it's amazing. You'd think anything would disrupt the ovary or follicles, right? But it doesn't. Um, there are only certain specific uh, endocrine disrupting factors that affect the ovary. Um, and then we can see, then test some of these endocrine disrupting factors on the rest of the reproductive tract. And along these lines, yes, we can test drugs. Um, this adds complexity to what's currently available in vitro. A lot of the drugs are screened preclinically using cell lines. Um, but here we have 3D renditions of um, each tissue. And then not only that, we can put them together to, to make a more complex system to see how drugs are either metabolized or maybe retained or um, uh, to, to, to see how that eventually affects reproductive tissues, et cetera. So um, there's a lot of possibilities that has opened up with the development of lattice. Um, and so here I showed you um, how we can apply lattice to disease modeling. Um, so as a summary, just uh, being able to study a more systematic um, um, system. Um, we can understand how risk factors that, are, that we've known um, are, are associated through epidemiologic studies. We can now test them in the lab to see, yes, these particular risk factors such as fat, or such as hyperinsulinemia, this is how it affects the downstream tissues biologically. 
Um, we can test um, multiple drugs as well. And personalized medicine, I just glossed over it, but this is something that we're thinking of doing where we've started using induced pluripotent stem cells. Um, we have been able to generate these stem cells from women with endometriosis to see if there is any genetic component of the disease that is contributing to um, um, the, the, the progesterone resistance that we find in these women, um, as well as um, the, the disease itself. So, so much can be done. And so building a reproductive tract in vitro, um, there's a lot of different choices that we can make in terms of the cell sources, whether we use primary or iPSCs or cell lines or tissues, whether we organize them in 2D or 3D or in explants, uh, and whether we culture them in normal 24 well plates or in a dynamic tissue culture system. Um, there are many to choose from, et cetera. Um, but really the take home message here is we have to allow biology to dictate what models we use. We cannot force models on biology. And so um, each experiment is gonna be context dependent. We need to know what we want to study, what we think is gonna happen, and then build models to answer those questions. And so that, that's what I have for you today. Um, I uh, do want to acknowledge the team that first started in this project, uh, Teresa Woodruff as the PI, um, and all of the, uh, my colleagues at UIC and Northwestern, as well as Draper Labs, who really made that first EVATAR system um, and set the ball rolling. And then our uh, second part is the disease modeling tissue chip two part, where we brought in um, people from Northwestern that are uh, experts in PCOS, like Margaret Urbanek, um, reproductive endocrinology um, doctors, such as Christina Boots, uh, Teresa Woodruff's lab, who uh, started this. Um, and then at UIC, Joanna Burdett's lab that are experts in ovarian cancer and fallopian tube. Um, and then um, Dr. Zhao at Rutgers University, who does all of the compound screenings and uh, from these follicle cultures. Um, and so I also do want to acknowledge all the funding sources of NIEHS, National Cancer Institute, Office of Research of Women's Health, and National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences. And so I guess that's all I have, and I'm sure you guys have questions, and I look forward to having this discussion. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Kim. That was fascinating. Um, so while I wait for some further questions to trickle in, let me just uh, ask you just a, a few to start off with for me. Um, it looks like the lattice system would be capable of also modeling the male reproductive system if you mm. saw out the cell types. Is, is that true? It, it, it's not that we need any more research on males, as you pointed out, but, uh, but is in principle oh. it's possible, right? Absolutely. And, and Teresa actually did start that and um, she called it the dude cube. <laughs> She's really great at naming these systems. Um, and basically, um, we're able to take testes tissues and look at, you know, testosterone function and production um, to study like azospermia, etc. Um, and so, yes, absolutely. If there are tissues available and a biological disease to study, um, these, these systems are conducive for that. Yes. Great. Okay, so I'm going to categorize some of the questions that have come in. First, I'm going to start with some of the more technical, specific questions, and then we'll zoom out to some of the broader social questions. And in fact, Julie, if you want to open up the Q&A box, you can kind of follow on with this first question. It's a little bit technical. It's from Ian Vesica. He asks, this is a technical question, was the LH surge prior to P increase being artificially introduced or, replica or replicated in the mouse model with the larger dose injections given by the investigator? Thank yes, you. that's a great, that's a great question. Yes, um, the, there are certain concentrations that have been figured out where um, we do add a lot more HCG um, a day a prior. Um, and after that, what we see is a swelling of the, um, uh, of the follicle and actual the popping out of the uh, oocyte. Can I share a movie that um, we just got hot off the press to show this? Uh, I'm, I'm up for that. Yes, go ahead. I am so excited about this because this, it's incredible. Um, I'm going to stop sharing. How do I do? Oh, I'm going to share. 
here. All right, so I wanna show you, this is um, time-lapse over many days. And this is an ovary um, that has been cultured. As you can see, the follicles are growing, right? And then after we add, do you, do you see that, that, that oocyte coming out? Here's another one coming out. Here's another one coming out. It's incredible. I mean, we have ovulation occurring um, in, in lattice. Wow. As you can see. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> I, I just, yeah. I'm so well, excited about that. So this actually leads into a really uh, excellent question that's just come in from uh, Jean Barak Parker. Since Evatar and Lattice have been developed, are they in general use by other labs? And if so, what applications are being studied? Yes, and so we are using Lattice in our lab. Uh, so Evatar is available, but not currently being used for, for reasons that I've mentioned, how expensive it is and how difficult it is to use. Um, Lattice is um, being developed and we do want to commercialize it. We want to get it in the hands of the researchers. And so we use it in the lab. Um, uh, other, our collaborators use it. And you can do, it's, it's, the system is tissue agnostic and disease agnostic. As, as long as you have a question where um, two different um, or two plus different tissues are interacting in a specific disease, or it doesn't even have to be disease. You can look at um, tissue longevity, um, long-term cultures of whatever it is you're studying. And as I mentioned in, in my lab, we're looking at obesity and endometrial organoids to see what kind of changes occur in the presence of fat. Um, we're also trying to figure out um, whether um, metformin is affecting um, uh, the endometrial cancer cells or is it affecting blood vessels or is it affecting the fat in the obese context? So these are some of the really neat questions that we can ask um, and, and experiment with. Yeah, uh, so I have, I have a follow-up question to that then. So it looks like um, the last system is going to be wonderful for interrogating all kinds of questions around drug safety, drug screening. Um, can you modify the system in a way that you can look at drug safety for women who are pregnant? Right. Um, I mean, I think eventually, um, as long as the model systems are there, we can, I mean, as, as you know, from um, being in the tissue chip meetings, there are placental biologists that have um, represented placenta and microfluidics. And so placental function can be definitely studied, especially in terms of crossing that placental barrier um, do the drugs actually get to the, the fetus or not? Um, those are something that, some things that can be studied. Um, and what other things are involved in pregnancy? Um, maybe in the early events of pregnancy, um, does it actually affect an implanting embryo? Um, there's a really neat study, not, not in microfluidics, but using organoids uh, from a group, group in the UK where they actually co-cultured um, embryos with um, endometrial, they call it assembloids, but they're basically organoids to see how um, the, uh, that uh, influences embryo, um, embryo um, properties like expansion, for example. And so these, these are um, being done in terms of the pregnant concept, but um, I think uh, we just, we, we need a lot more um, work in that, in building the models. But of course, I think it is, it is possible. Great. So let me move on to questions that relate to um, donors and uh, sources of your cells. So this is a question that Bridget Dooney is asking, I believe on behalf of Caroline Lowenthal. Hi, Caroline. Um, some women know they don't want to have children or know that they're done having children. Are these women ever considered as a source for biological samples that could otherwise compromise fertility? Um, we don't, um, we just, um, get access to tissues from the OR from women undergoing surgery for whatever indications. Um, I, I'm not sure what the channels would be for uh, obtaining uh, tissues like that. Uh, I'm not aware. Maybe other people are. Um, but, um, I, I, I guess, uh, once if, if a patient wanted to donate, their tissues, um, that would be something, but we, we, we don't do that, no. 
So Julie, uh, I have a question for you. Uh, all the soil types that you have on lattice, do they have to come from the same donor? No, no. Right now, what we have are um, different uh, cell sources, uh, all human except for the ovary. Mm -hmm. um, and it is, it is a challenge when you're not working with a hospital and, and the, the number of surgeries are not there, uh, especially during the pandemic. It was, it was very hard to get any kinds of tissues. Um, because these are electrosurgeries that uh, a lot of the, we get a lot of the tissues from. Um, so no, to answer your question, no, they don't have to come from um, the same person. Um, but there is something to be said about personalized medicine. Like I said, it would be great to see um, all of these different uh, tissues uh, being uh, made from uh, one patient source and to see how that particular um, patient uh, response to whatever it is, hormones, drugs, compounds, et cetera. Right. Well, so I, I'm thinking that, um, so I, I was really fascinated by what you said earlier about sort of like women's participation and enrollment in research in the past and, and, and the lack of proper uh, adequate involvement in numbers of, of research subjects that represent female biology. Um, I think there may be actually through the lattice system, a, a, even like a greater opportunity to expand the scope of who gets to participate in this kind of research to populations that are typically underserved for which it would actually even be di difficult to enroll them as human subjects in the trial, people in like far away places or, or um, people who are resource poor settings. If you just need their cells, if you just need um, you know cells that represent the biology to then put into the lattice system, that could provide a, a possible way to enroll a more broad, diverse range of research participants than kind of doing you know in-person in clinical studies uh, in, in a particular cohort. I mean, are, do you think that there's an opportunity to use lattice, like the lattice system, to sort of expand not just you know greater involvement of women whose biology is represented in the studies, but just among women, different types of, of of women who typically are not enrolled in studies or don't get the opportunity to participate in the study because you're using right. cells. Oh yeah, I mean, I think the possibilities are endless, and I can totally see in the future after we are able to make all of these different uh, model systems to do just that. Um, like I said, lattice is just the plate that allows communication between wells. Um, with that said, um, yes, we can get, we can simply get blood from women um, and then make them into iPSCs and then make different organ systems and then put them on lattice and, and study them. We're, we're also trying to figure out if lattice is conducive to differentiating the iPSCs into the different tissue types, only because um, I don't know if anybody has worked in that field, it's extremely labor intensive. Um, they require handling every single day, no holidays, no exceptions. And some of them require hundreds of days before you actually get the final tissues. But if we can use Lattice to kind of provide that daily um, nutrients and stimulants um, without somebody being there every day, maybe give them a two or three day weekend. Um, so that's, that's something that we're also working on as, as well, um, which is really exciting. So a lot of these things are very possible. And I think the fact that you did identify those needs, I mean, I don't even think about things like that, um, but that is such a great need to involve patients that normally wouldn't come into the clinical trials just get some blood from them and just do it. I mean, that, that, what, that, that, that is so cool. That is, that is. Yeah, really I mean, I, I was right. thinking there are so many barriers to participation for people who are underprivileged. I mean, they can't take time off sometimes to even be in a study. Absolutely. Uh, so if you just need healthy tissue from them, and, and it's not even like they have to give up a major part of their body, they can just provide cells, right. uh, somatic cells. Mm -hmm. That, that could really be quite revolutionary to, to get the kind of data that's rich for a population that's, that's kind of got that genetic diversity you're hoping for. Um, right. There are some really interesting possibilities. Let me ask you further of, of the lattice system. So it seems it sounds like it's much automated, like there had, does have to be somebody there 24 seven overseeing it, is that correct? It's, it's sort of, you can sort of let it run on its own? Correct. I mean, you always, we, we have a system where there is, there's a well that has media um, and it ha you have about three mils of media and that depending on how much media you want it to flow through has to be replenished 
And that can happen over a course of two or three days. So yes, it can run um, for, for a couple of days without you watching it, right? Well, yeah, I mean, the, the, the time and labor intensive nature of, for example, IPSL research, when you said that, it just reminded me, my, my son doesn't want to be involved in that because he just says like he needs to not be in the lab all weekend long. So it's very, it's very labor intensive. But if you could do a lot of this work through an automated system, that could really, uh, I think, uh -huh. make some changes to the workforce uh, and, and sort of like the, the, the yes. involved at the lab. So you don't get people like my son saying, I don't want to go into that field because I, I can't, I don't want to go in every day. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah. it, it takes a certain person to dedicate every day to come into the lab to babysit those cells, yes. Oh, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I, I'm wondering, um, so let, let's get on to this workforce issue. Um, there are a lot of young kids who are interested in STEM who say you know, they want to be a doctor or they, they want to be an engineer. I don't think a lot of them, not yet anyway, think that they want to become somebody who works in developing microphysiological systems, right? Like how, how, do you, how do you sort of get the word out? Like how does one find out about this besides going into initially biology, cell biology, and then learning in graduate school, the kind of work that you guys are doing? How, does, how would somebody learn to get uh, this field on their radar? It, would they, would they kind of like hear about this through engineering? How, how does a young person like find out about what you do? Well, um, I really think young people know so much more about technology and where to find things and the, uh, the avenues that they have are just incredible. Um, I think if, if we do a good job on just highlighting what, what tools we have um, in to, to use in the lab, um, that'll disseminate through like a, a social media, Twitter, et cetera. Um, I think, you know, I think as long as the word gets out, um, it's, it's so fascinating. And I think somebody would be immediately drawn to something that can be to do so many different things uh, for the betterment of physiology and for diseases, et cetera. Um, I don't think it would be too hard to, to really uh, represent that um, in, in just uh, overall. Um, where would these uh, young kids hear it from? You know, I, I, other than what I just said, um, I, I, we, we also host, you know, um, uh, high schools to, to come in and take a look for a day, uh, what we do. Um, and there are many programs that we can do for that too. Um, um, I don't know what, what I don't know. I that's definitely yeah. an area. I, mean, I have this question on my mind a lot because I, I'm yeah. you know doing work in the Cambridge Boston area with a lot of companies that that are struggling to sort of develop the kind of workforce that they need in the future for these kinds of technologies. And a lot of people don't really realize that this is I think an open new area of research using micro microfluidic systems, exceed modeling using cell types from donors. It's not in the traditional kind of radar of people thinking about medicine and research and human subjects research. Uh, it's, got, it's quasi engineering, it's quasi cell biology, it's quasi medicine, it's kind of got a lot of that. Can you explain a little bit, describe a little bit more to me your team members, like, like what are their disciplines? You've obviously collaborated with lots of uh, people. Who who's typically comes together on a project like this and what are their backgrounds? So how did they get together? Yes, um, my lab is primarily made of cellular and molecular biologists, um, but we do have a bioengineer postdoc um, that we um, uh, recruited. Uh, we did work with another bioengineering student that was in the bioengineering field at Northwestern. Um, so it's, it's very important to collaborate with those bioengineers. Um, we did um, partner up with engineers at Draper um, and it was a very interesting interaction. I mean, we learned so much from them and vice versa. Um, it's a different language, but I feel like those, those borders or those boundaries uh, are being blurred more um, as people become more interested and, and they extend out. Um, I don't think you have to have a bioengineering degree to be able to work on microfluidics. Um, and et cetera, the, you don't have to be um, a strict molecular biologist to understand 
um, what a bioengineer can do with their systems as long as um, uh, the team interact at closely together and, and you know there's so much information out there as well um, that we can plug into so I do have a diverse team um, and I do I do work with experts in each of the areas to make sure we're doing it right. Mm -hmm. I was also fascinated when you were describing the development of these technologies that what you have to use are materials that don't bind with hormones. Uh, yes. How was that? How was that discovered? Was that through trial and error? I, I, I thought that was really fascinating. Yeah, um, I, I believe so. Well, the PDMS, I believe we had tried it very, very early on, and we were we were not getting the hormone levels that we should have. And then, you know, we found that yes, those hydrophilic molecules do bind to PDMS, and so it was that was a challenge of looking for uh, a good material um, to be able to um, to make these fluidics, and so we just went back to to what everybody uses in cell culture is polystyrene, right? And that's inert. Um, and so that's that's what we based our uh, construction out of. Um, but it is it is um, an area, like a lot of the microfluidics out there, the MPSs are made out of PDMS. And so there are limitations, exactly. Um, as long as you're measuring what the tissue is seeing, if it's sufficient, I think those are some of the precautions that need to be taken. Um, and, but we do need to be aware that some of these materials are, are not good. And finding that some of these materials actually leach toxins. I mean, if you're working with cells that are pretty robust and, you know, they're, they're hardy, um, they don't really show too many signs of these toxins, but then you're working with real sensitive cultures like the ovary or the follicles, um, then, then yeah, it matters. It matters what materials you use. Yeah, yeah. I, I have a few more technical questions, and then I'll get to some of the, the, the broader ethical issues in a minute. Yeah. So, in the very early days of tissue culture research, people thought that light had an effect on the tissue culture. So, people would wear like dark clothes, and they'd be like in darkened rooms. I don't think people do that anymore. But are there? This may be a hard question for you to answer. But are there like concerns you have about other ways in which you may be creating artifacts in your system that you're constantly on guard for? And how, how do you? How do you scan the horizon for those kinds of concerns, right? Like, uh, so I, I suppose that the system is kind of at, at body temperature and it's kind of got like, it, it mimics as much as possible the human body. Are there other, like anything else besides like the materials that you're using and whether they're leaching toxins or binding with, <laughs> with hormones or the other things about the system that you're kind of worried in the back of your mind, hey, maybe this is doing something we don't want it to do. Yeah, yeah, uh, of course. I mean, that, that, that is always at the back of our minds. Other than um, the actual materials or the environment. Okay, so there's one thing in the environment and that's not just our microfluidics uh, environment, but um, just cell culture in general. We do put them in 5% CO2, right? And in the body, there's a lot more than 5% CO2. And that, that's always been kind of um, strange to me, but that, that is the standard that we use for all incubators. Um, um, and that's, that's what we've done. Um, there, there, you know what the, the 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 things that not concern me, but that are at the forefront of my mind is the missing cell types, right? In the body, you have immune cells that are really important. They do so much more than um, just to protect you from infections. They do have biological roles in each of the tissues, um, especially if you're talking about the the menstrual cycle and the tissues the changes that are occur um, in response to hormones, those immune cells are really important in, in contributing to some of those changes, right? Um, blood vessels, we don't have any blood vessels in our system and they're really important, especially if you want to see bleeding, if you want to see all the blood cells, you know, degrading at menses, or, you know, so, so there are certain cell types that are missing. Um, we don't know how to incorporate them yet into our system, um, but um, we, we think that they will be essential to really give us a more um, complete uh, view of what, what's happening. Yeah, um, so I have to apologize for my audience because I have a few more technical questions and then you know, we'll, we'll jump yeah, into yeah, the other yeah, stuff. Yeah. Uh, so, so the other question, are there any mechanical or other like, like pressure uh, aspects of the system that, that you, need to, you need to be mindful of? So, the microfluidic system, obviously, uh, you can control things like pressure and mechanical forces. Do, is there, 
Is there much thinking that has to go into that? Um, so in, that's we, we really wanted to make a more simpler system. So it's the computer that really um, directs and controls how much flow goes by, um, how much, um, and this is a, a question from my bioengineering postdoc actually, um, but while we were building Lattice, we did run into a lot of those problems to figure out what is the um, good flow rate that is representative, what is the pressure, uh, the hydrostatic, you know, differences, um, depending on um, your, your culture system and the design, um, what happens when there's extra media that's left over and you're, you know, you're um, rotating it like for, for, for days, is there, is there going to be a compensation that needs to occur? You know, th these are all things that um, definitely need to be um, worked out when building a, a system like Lattice. And I think we've run into every problem that um, is possible. And finally, we're, we're at a working um, place right now and, and, and it's working really well. So, um, did I answer your question? I mean, oh yeah, you, you yeah. did. So, so it is it is it is true that those are complicating factors. That you have oh to, yes, yes. You know. uh, are you are you submitting to FDA or have you submitted to FDA this uh, lattice? And 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 if so, like what application are you? If you can if you can speak about that at all. So, submitting sorry. to the FDA just just like for FDA approval. Is this something that needs FDA approval? Is it going to be a diagnostic? Like how do you sort of frame this to FDA? I, I first want researchers to use them at the bench. Um, we're going to collect more data. We did. That's what we need. It's more data, not just in the reproductive system, but data like anywhere to see how useful it can be. Um, and so we want to make more of it uh, and, and train more people on it. My postdoc always says I can train you in an hour to use it. So it's it's, it's a pretty easy system. Um, but even before we get to the FDA, but we eventually do want it to be able to be used as a drug screening tool, uh, at, in which case then we would have to go through those regulations. But I feel like yeah. we kind of need to gather the data first. Yeah, yeah. I, I suppose that you would have to confront this question, or you are confronting this question before you even get to the FDA, if you're going to have other researchers use the system. But the question is, how confident are you that this is actually recapitulating the human biological system? Uh, like, how do you actually validate what um, Lattice and Evitar are doing against "quote unquote" the real, the real deal, the real human body? Is what are your reference points to know that this is actually doing what you're hoping it's doing? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Um, we're not saying that this system is totally recapitulating what you see in the body, um, uh, because when we are missing some of those key factors, and you know, we're, what we're pushing through is media. And media is not blood. Um, we would love to put in blood sometimes, you know, to, to try to figure out how we do that. Um, but th those are some of the, the, the things that we need to tackle first. Um, that I, I, I could you could you just repeat your question? Oh, again? Yeah. So so I mean so what are your benchmarks for for? Thinking? Oh yes yes whether it's um, physiological or not. Um, like I said, we do know a lot that goes on in, in vivo um, because we've been able to get uh, at least samples from women, uh, at least you know in different cycles, but also from those animal studies. Um, we can we can we know what needs to happen, and so we take all of that information as our frame of reference, um, all the in vivo studies, um, and then we compare it to what we have done in vitro from what we've had. And we do see differences that uh, recapitulate more the in vivo than the in vitro. Um, and so we're, we're, we find that we're kind of moving in the right direction, at least. Um, at least it's, it's a bit more physiologic. We're not saying it's perfect. Um, there's a lot more work to be done, but we are getting new discoveries and we're new information because these, these are in, in a, a more natural environment as well as a more natural architecture and shape. Great. So one last uh, technical question has come in anonymously. Because sharing media between the organ types helps them grow or become responsive, how do you think common media changes uh, at once every three days are influencing the system? Have you tried refreshing only half the media to see if it yields any benefits? 
I'm assuming that they're talking about conventional cell culture media when you change media every three days um, in static culture. Um, yeah, definitely, depending on your cells and how metabolically active they are, um, they're going to be sitting in um, uh, waste products and stresses. Um, they're not going to be seeing the, the additional uh, uh, nutrients, the fresh nutrients, because they've used them all up, etc. And so I think there are, there are changes or responses that you're going to see because of cell culture artifacts. Um, we have done some studies to show that uh, comparing static and microfluidic, where um, the, uh, the availability of glucose is different, so the, um, the health is different of the different cells and tissues. And so definitely there, there is a difference between static and microfluidic cultures. Uh, so Bridget Duny asks, what were, uh, what were you most surprised about in the results of your study or these types of studies? You know, when you do a study like this, and one of the reasons why it was so fun was because it was not really hypothesis driven, but it was basically building something and saying, let's see what happens uh, without much expectation. And so what I personally was very surprised about was how all of these different tissues from different human sources, as well as the mouse ovary were okay in one media. And not only were they okay, they responded to those hormones a lot more robustly. And so I think going into this, we knew so little about all the paracrine factors of each of our tissues in isolation that are so important for the other tissues. And so I guess um, it was more naive on our part, but um, that was what surprised us the most, how physiologic, I put those in quotations, more physiologic these tissues were behaving. Mm -hmm. Well, it was fascinating to hear about the evolution from Ubatar to Lattice. What's, what's sort of the next generation? What's coming after Lattice? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, you know, if there was a way where we can be more high throughput, as you can see, Lattice had eight, eight different compartments. Um, that's not really high throughput. Um, and if you want to start testing drugs, um, you would need many more samples there represented there. Um, I'm not sure how I would do that, but that would be, again, I guess, the next need for the field is to be able, if we're confident enough, to be able to test multiple drugs and multiple um, concentrations and then comparing that. I'm not saying that, that these MPS systems are going to replace standard 2D. I think we need all of these systems to give us, to inform us of, of how the drugs are working, depending on the context, experimental design, right? Um, and so I, I'm the believer that, you know, the more information that we get, the better. Um, so is it going to eliminate mice studies? Uh, I don't think so. It might reduce the number of mice that are used in, in research, but I think those in vivo studies will inform us, again, whether um, differences in the drug happen, different responses happen in the microfluidics versus the mice, and if so, why, you know? So I think those are all important questions as well. Mm -hmm. So um, you mentioned that that you're, you are now sharing the lattice technology with other labs. Is it, it well, I was really also very interested in how you were trying as you're developing this technology to, to, to keep it cost effective, to keep it kind of, um, you know, User friendly for other other labs, is was there a little bit more thought given to um, trying to make this a useful tool for people in lower resource countries, labs that are kind of like less resource than Northwestern, um, people in other other countries who might want to do this kind of work? Is is this technology going to enable them to do a higher level of research in their more limited research setting um, at their institutions? Was there thought in that kind of like, you know, kind of democratization of the technology? Yeah, and, and again, you bring up such interesting questions. And I think, yes, the question is, we would love to see that. Um, you know, we, we did, and that was our, our goal to make it, to make anybody be able to afford something if they want it. And that's why we went with 3D printing. 
right? Uh, everybody can do 3D printing now, but unfortunately um, that didn't work out. But somebody can find a material that is, uh, is great for 3D printing um, to, to print out these systems, that would be even better. Um, but yes, um, that was our goal to make it user-friendly for not just Northwestern people, um, but for, for everybody across the board. Um, and we are uh, sharing it with just our immediate circle because we don't have enough units right now. Um, but the goal is to partner up with a, a company that will enable us to make more units um, so that the cost can go down even more potentially and then um, share it. And the training, again, um, it's very easy. It's just, you know, telling um, what the scripts to write uh, on the computers and, um, and it'll just run. So that, that, that's our ultimate goal. Yeah. Um, so one last question. Do you have any ethical concerns about this technology? Anything that, that you, you think we should keep our minds on? Hmm. Again, this is just a technology. It's just a tool. It's a plate. Um, it's, it's something that you can control. Um, I think the ethical questions come in when you're asking about the uh, experimental question. Um, what is your experimental question? Are you going to be needing tissues that normally you can't get or shouldn't get? I think the ethical questions are there. And I think that's where you're the expert on these. Um, but again, this is just a tool. Um, it's like a cell culture plate, um, a second generation that allows you to do a lot more things than you can conventionally. That was my way of skirting the question because I don't really know. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that, that, that's wonderful. I mean, I think this is such an interesting technology. It's why I invited you for this series. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for leading us through these wonderful developments. Uh, good luck with your research going forward. So I'd like to conclude our session for today. Uh, I want to thank the Center for Bioethics at Harvard Medical School for sponsoring this event. I want to thank Ashley Troutman and Hella Stephanidis for all the logistical support in this uh, series. And I want to thank you, our audience, for joining us today for this session. I uh, hope you learned a lot. I know I did. Uh, please join us next fall when this session, when the series recontinues, and we'll have plenty more to talk about next fall. Um, so until then, thank you for joining us. Have a great weekend. We'll see you next time. Thank you so much.